So, today we are going to be discussing uh, two Voyager episodes. No worries. <laughs> I did that earlier today. Uh, we're going to be discussing two Voyager episodes, two of my favorite ones. Uh, the first one is Scientific Method, and the next one is Year in Hell, uh, parts one and two. And both are fantastic. Both uh, are fabulous. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Uh, like I said, if uh, you didn't catch this at the beginning, I have a new webcam. There's a chance it might die because it's new and scary. <laughs> and so, um, but right, these episodes are so good and I don't know how they're subsequent. Like when I looked up the numbers, I was like, oh yeah, these are back to back. I got to say season four is killer. Season four is fabulous. Um, so yeah, we're going to start with scientific method just chronologically, and then we'll go and talk about year, uh, year of hell. So first is scientific method. And I get this one confused with distant origin occasionally when it comes to, and you've probably caught me doing it. If not, <laughs> uh, have done it yourself. And if you didn't catch me, great. But typically, uh, the reason I get them confused is the different aliens using different methods for cloaking and distant origin, they use, um, time. They basically temporal cloak themselves. Hey, Starmic. Um, and in this one, they don't necessarily go into the details. They just have some type of cloaking device that they are, uh, keeping secret. But for those of you who might not remember this, who didn't have a chance to go check these out. This is the one where, uh, first of all, mainly Janeway is just like super irritable and having an anxiety attack and she's at the end of her rope. Um, everyone's like behaving a little bit weird. Paris and Bellana are now hooking up on the DL, <laughs> um, which isn't weird, but they're hooking up on the DL and they are, um, and essentially the reveal is that they are being studied by an alien species and they're being having experiments performed on them. But <laughs> yeah, out of phase, pretty much like, pretty much like Jordy and Roe, um, in that episode, which I think was just called in phase, out of phase, phased something. <laughs> that was the transporter accident that got them slightly out of phase. That's essentially the level of detail they go into this one. Um, but essentially if we go through kind of the big highlights, I'm less, um, excited about the scientific experiments that are happening as much as I am super geeked out about the, um, the fact that we are at a binary pulsar system. <laughs> like not even kidding. That's basically my highlight for this. So they, Janeway is essentially getting a massage because she's super stressed out and is experiencing stress headaches. So <laughs> Janeway, I get you girl. Um, and she gets called up to the bridge because they're getting these strong energy readings from a binary pulsar system. And the gravitational forces are so intense that they are trying to uh, that they will pull in everything about 50 million kilometers away from them. Uh, there's also a lot of gamma ray radiation and they're trying to collect data from them. All fabulous. All fabulous. Um, <laughs> there's so many, there's so many super creepy aliens, um, episodes, but this one, we're going to talk about binary pulsar systems really quick because we are here to talk science in science fiction and the images that they show of this binary pulsar system is essentially these two very bright objects and you can actually see these light beams going off in different directions and you have this close, close star system. All of that's kind of works. And I'm pretty sure that they, you know, looked up, uh, if their science advisor for this, I don't know if they had one or, um, or if they didn't, I don't know. Don't think Larry's here, <laughs> but, um, you know, if you look up pictures of a, a binary star system, binary pulsar star system, it looks exactly like this, like an artist rendition of it. So that's a really good question, DTG. And if they would be able to, and now we can get into science -y science of this because I did my PhD and postdoctoral research on gravitational waves from binary pulsar systems. 
<laughs> That's why we're so excited. That was me burying the lead right there. <laughs> so um, with pulsars, essentially what they are are remnants of supermassive stars. So supermassive stars have gone through their life, then they go supernova, then they collapse down, and you either end up with a neutron star or a black hole. So if it's really massive, it'll further collapse into a black hole. Otherwise, you end up with a neutron star. Neutron stars are those ones that we've talked about before where, you know, it's basically the entire mass of the sun that is condensed down to the size of a large city. Now, uh, when I say the mass of a sun, a lot of people are like, well, but didn't you say that they were supermassive stars and our star won't result in that? Yes. What is left over after the star supernovas is about the mass of our sun, uh, typically about 0.8 to 1.2 solar masses. Um, that will be a neutron star. Now, if that neutron star is beaming out a ton of energy from that collapse, so you have this huge collapse, if there was some rotation component, you get a lot of energy being beamed out kind of like a, a lighthouse. And this can, you know, do that uh, depending on which direction it's pointing. And if we are in the path of that light beam, like a lighthouse, Hi, Zach. We are full science right now. <laughs> um, you will get these regular pulses. And Jocelyn Bell Burnell was one of the first scientists to actually detect this in radio data. She did not get the credit nor the Nobel Prize for it, but we give her our credit as much as we can. Um, but she was pretty awesome and discovered that these pulses in the radio data are coming from neutron stars that happen to have energy pointed at us. Now, in terms of where the field with neutron star and pulsar research um, is, I bet you didn't think we'd get this heavy talking about scientific method, but here we are. Um, the thing is, is that what we're trying to study is how many, um, you know, how many massive stars result in neutron stars. We can kind of figure that out. If you've heard the term, the Chandrasekhar limit, that kind of has to do with this as well. Um, how many neutron stars are out there that have these energy beams, how wide those energy beams are, like, and just the general population of massive stars. All of those are unknown, effectively. Uh, we have good guesses. It's all statistics. It's population studies. But we really have a, um, there's huge error margins on that because we're still studying. We don't know if every neutron star is beaming energy because we don't know exactly how big the beam is and if they're pointed at us and how many are the of them are there out there. Uh, this is why statistics is important and fun, but that's why you need a lot of math if you're going to do an astrophysics degree is because of these sort of problems. So that was a long way to DTG's question about what if they're pointed at each other. Those beams are the result of essentially angular momentum. When we saw um, gamma ray bursts, which long gamma ray bursts are the result of a star exploding, um, we had, we've, we did the math, we collectively, humanity, did the math and calculated that if that much energy that we were detecting here was in all directions, it would be physically impossible. Like you could not have any physics method that would actually result in that much energy being beamed um, in all directions. So we realized it had to be going in a certain direction. Um, and then that bears out from angular momentum. So this idea of like rotation and then energy beams this way, um, you, with angular momentum, you're gonna get it beamed in a certain direction. And that's why with a binary star system, because like our solar system, you know, as it formed, it all, because of angular momentum, went into a plane and all the planets orbit in the same direction and rotate mostly in the same direction. The ones that rotate opposite rotate very slowly. And so the leading theory with that is that something hit them early in their formation. Um, yeah, I know, I see it. <laughs> We're gonna try to make it through if this, uh, if this camera dies on me, I have a, I have my backup ready to go. It'll be like a two minute turnover. So stick with me. Um, but I'm hoping we can make this work out. Um, if it is obnoxious, let me know and I can just switch it over right now, but we'll, we'll hang in there and 
see how good or bad it gets. Um, but thank you for telling me. So uh, with a binary star system, you are going to assume that they also formed at the same time, particularly if they are at the same sort of stage in their life. So two pulsars, you have two massive stars that exploded, died, and now they're orbiting each other. Um, if they're orbiting each other like this, which is what we saw in the image, then the beams should be pretty much out like this because of angular momentum. There's not really a physics way that you could have the beams going like this and the stars orbiting each other like that. Um, if that were the case, then they would be very, very, very far apart and held together. Um, like, you know, their gravitational influence on each other would be minimal. So I think that, I think that makes sense. Yeah. So it's all about angular momentum, right hand rule stuff. That's why we see the beams going up close to perpendicular to their plane of rotation. <laughs> all of that from one quick image that we got <laughs> as Voyagers hanging out, studying a binary pulsar system. Um, Gravitational forces would be intense, as they talked about. Um, you know, these are borderline black holes. Um, we don't know how many binary neutron star systems there are versus a neutron star and a black hole system. Uh, that's something that we're studying. We have confirmed that short gamma ray bursts, less big flashes of gamma ray radiation that last less than two seconds, are formed from a neutron star merging with either another neutron star or a black hole. So we know these binary star systems exist. We know that they're out there. Um, and we're still trying to figure out the population of them, how many how many there are out there, how often it happens. Um, but still, cool, awesome, objectively awesome. <laughs> Um, I did write in this because Janeway was like so stressed out and cranky to be there and she had her like massage interrupted and she forgot to put on her uniform and everything um, that when she's observing this binary pulsar system and recall that Janeway, um, <laughs> thanks Zach, um, when she recalled like recall that Janeway was a science officer and when she basically is like gazing at this binary pulsar system in front of them, she's like, just take notes. I'm going to be in my ready room. That's the flag that something's wrong. <laughs> Something is wrong with Captain Janeway if she doesn't want to hang out and actually study a uh, stellar phenomena. So just bear that in mind. Um, them being uh, about 50 million kilometers away to stay out of the gravitational forces is pretty valid. Um, we are about 150 million kilometers away um, from the sun, so that's fine. A lot of high gamma radiation, that is also valid. Uh, that there's just high, remember gamma ray radiation is like that super high energy electromagnetic waves. That is absolutely valid as well. Um, they have decided to keep an orbit of initially 80 million kilometers. So it's the only sort of issue that I have with that is that these would be tiny, tiny, tiny objects if they were 80 million kilometers away because now they're about half the distance between us and the sun and they are about the size of a big city. So they would be super tiny. Um, that's why it's so cool to actually see like the jets and nebulas around a neutron star, but we can't actually observe a neutron star because that's super, super tiny on space scales. Um, so I will write that off as a magnification <laughs> that when they're looking on it at the view screen, they are magnifying their stellar phenomenon. And I am 100% fine with that. Okay, so um, they decide to actually stay to 90 million kilometers because they're getting random proton bursts that could knock out the shields. Random proton bursts, that is kind of solar radiation. We don't really know how much um, solar wind these actually massive particles, protons, would be radiating from neutron stars, from dead stars, versus how much is actually blown off at the initial supernova. Um, but that's just something that like we, I don't think we have data on. We don't know how, how often that happens, um, but still interesting and cool. Um, Tom and Bolana are busted, um, <laughs> super busted and Janeway's cranky. Janeway lays into them. 
uh, she does not having it, and it makes me very, very uncomfortable because it's like my mom is yelling at my friends. <laughs> Um, so that stresses me the hell out. Um, but still, prime, prime Janeway moment. Uh, now, now what starts going on? <laughs> exactly. Why is mom yelling at our friends? Um, yeah, mine was when she dismissed the uh, binary pulsar system. I was like, something, something's wrong with Janeway. This is not okay. And then she got into cranky mom mode. And we're like, ooh. Anyway. Uh, Chakotay's hair starts falling out. Um, because I don't do well with biology or squishy things, I really am not a big fan of the rapid aging. Um, it reminded me of District 9. Hey, Junie, thanks for being here. Um, it reminded me of District 9, um, which I'm not at. Like, District 9 is great. I'm not a fan of, like, the, you know, instant body things that, uh, Black Swan also scarred and Chicote just going and brushing all of his hair falling out. Um, not fun either. They essentially find out that he's rapidly aging and they think, and I do really like this, they think that there might, the initial sort of like hypothesis that they have is wondering what if it's the gamma ray radiation from, um, the neutron stars. Valid. They are currently being pummeled by gamma ray radiation. Now, the stars aren't beamed directly at them, but they are pretty close to high energy stars at this point. Um, so they think that it might be that, but it's just him. It's not the whole crew and they're not getting like radiation warnings. So good hypothesis, quick dismissal. Um, they figure out that the DNA is being stimulated, that like um, Neelix is starting to change into another species that is close to Talaxia. Um, and <laughs> and like rapidly aging, sim they're trying to figure out like what is happening to Neelix, but essentially both Chakotay and Neelix are, as, as uh, Becca mentioned, like they're just, complaining about their aches and pains, which is indeed adorable. And it's, I always like when we get pairings of characters that we don't typically see together. Um, now, Balana and the doctor are kind of studying this and figuring out what's going on. And they zoom into the cells. They get down to the sub-molecular sub particles. Um, but they're basically, I think, subatomic. Like they look like, you know, they look like balls. <laughs> Sorry. It's my maturity level. Um, but as there's, so I would say like they're, you know, zooming in on the molecules of some sort and then like actually zooming in on maybe the neutrons or the protons, but they're zooming in on the cells. Yeah, exactly. Submolecular would just be atoms and, um, and actually zooming in to see a stamp. They see like a, you know, old dystopian type. What was that? There was that, um, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Doll, was it Dollhouse that they all had the stamps on the back of their neck? Anyway, um, they see the barcode. It's essentially a barcode um, on in their molecules. And uh, they do, <laughs> I do like this. It's kind of a sweet, adorable doctor nerd moment where Bolana's like, well, this is, this is what's causing it. This is what's causing it. And he's like, um, we don't jump to conclusions. We're going to scientifically analyze it. Orphan black. That's what I was thinking of. Thank you. Um, but they do realize that these molecules, these subatomic particles really are slightly out of phase. So they start to compensate for it. They get a 0.15 phase variance in the molecules that are there. And so then things start to go bad. She basically falls on, like dies, almost dies. The doctor's program starts getting deleted. Um, he taps into seven of nine's audio implants, which I really like that, you know, he obviously has a lot of data on the Borg technology that from working so closely with seven and being in love with her, I still ship the doctor in seven. I will always ship the doctor in seven. Um, but he reaches out to her and he's like, no one else can hear me. I'm coming, I'm coming to you through your audio implants. And I need you to come meet me in the holodeck. Then he adjusts her ocular implants to have this phase variance of 0.15. So this is where it gets to be not the Jordy Rowe um, phase transporter accident where they're out of phase slightly. 
this is more because in order to be seen by them, they had to be like blasted with radiation, which I guess actually where it goes to. I didn't think about this as deeply as I should have. I think it is the same. I think it is the same because she starts, Seven starts to see these alien creatures that like literally come up to her and like stick her in the eye and she pretends not to see them and then walks away. Um, and she stays cool, which I would, uh, my face would have at least been. <laughs> um, but she comes back to the doctor and reports 56 aliens have been observed. They're all conducting experiments on everyone. You walk around like, um, you know, the kitchen, the caf cafe, I forget where it is. Um, and everyone's got like headbands on and like has all these experiments hanging off of them that no one can see, which is super creepy. But yeah, this, you know, mess hall. Thank you. Jesus. The mess hall. Um, that's what I was thinking with the phasers, because with Jordy and Ro, they were out of phase after their transporter accident. And then they had to be blasted with radiation effectively, um, in the same way that hitting them with the phasers decloaked them and is able to see them. Yeah. The phasers, it defazed them and it kind of worked. I mean, I think, I think it makes sense in as much as we know anything about it, but given that Jordy and Roe needed someone else, cause remember they couldn't touch anything. They were like just going through stuff. Uh, they needed some burst of energy to go through in the same way that hitting them with the phasers, you can immediately see them. And so they wanted to set up the EPS relays on Voyager to induce a neuroleptic shock field and essentially do what they did with Jordy and Roe and make everyone visible at once. But once the, the, basically the jig is up with that one and they can't do it. And Brad, I agree when she's in her writing room, super cranky and being mean to Tuvok and she, and then you see all these on here and like three people are hanging over her. Super creepy. Not, not a fan. Um, but once they sort of expose the secret out of necessity, because as we have said before, Tuvok is a fabulous security officer. He knows what's what. He sees Seven messing around with stuff and he's like, oh no, not today, sister. I know what you've done before. Um, he uh, goes over and stops Seven from adjusting the EPS relays and then she basically has to hit one of them with a phaser. They show up. Um, they're able to capture one, but now they prevent the ship from... They prevent anyone on the ship from being able to adjust these EPS relays. So Janeway is like, all right, I'm done. I'm done with all of you. Can't get rid of you. I'm cranky. You've made my life hell. I'm out of here and I'm taking you with me. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty great. I do love, I do love angry Janeway, even if it's not often seen, but she, moves them to less than 1 million kilometers from these pulsars. She's basically like, we're going to drive into these, this binary pulsar system and we are done. And, uh, the stress is 30 teradines. Um, sure. <laughs> on the ship and rising the hull gets to 9,000 degree temperature, which sucks as well. And Tuvok is like, we got a one in 20 chance of surviving this. The other aliens go, okay, nope, sorry. <laughs> you create, you create, we have our data. Um, yeah, there's, there's nothing as far as I can tell. Um, and they beam out of there. They just say, all right, I'm out. And the ships go and actually one gets destroyed because they're so close. The gravimetric shear, as it were. Um, I'm going to assume 9,000 degrees Kelvin because as soon as we're up into the thousands, you might as well use Kelvin. Fahrenheit's a made up system. And I mean, they're all made up systems, but metric versus not metric. And uh, we'll go with Kelvin, um, which is about the temperature on the surface of the sun. Sure, that works. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> if you want to use that, you can. That's awesome. Um, and she basically is like, all right, we're going to race between. They, they peace out. They're like, all right, now, now get us out of here, captain. And she basically goes full impulse between the stars, 
which would be the most neutral point to actually be able to get out of there because we have these things called effectively Lagrange points where you can look at the gravimetric the gravity field balance between objects, find where it's the most neutral, and then that's you're not going to be favored one or the other. Um, so she aims for that, and they make it out at full impulse. I mean, the ship's pretty beat up, but they get out of there by doing that, which I love, and actually was also done. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's because the science, we're blinding it all with science. <laughs> um, but this was also done in the Voltron Legendary Defender Netflix series, which if you follow me for a while, you know I will geek out constantly about how good the science in that is. Um, that they were having to fly through, I think it was a trinary system where it was like a black hole and two neutron stars, and they mapped out the gravitational path that they would need to follow through there. So uh, look that up. If you haven't, if you kind of like cartoons and, or especially if you have kids, um, and want some more cartoons that adults can enjoy too, the Voltron Legendary Defender series is awesome. But we don't need to talk more about that. Let's move on to Year of Hell. So Year of Hell, a uh, two-part episode right after this one. Uh, they really put Voyager through the ringer here. Um, <laughs> yeah, Voltron. Voltron all the way. Again, science was fabulous in that. Um... So, I love Year of Hell. It's an upsetting two-part episode set, but it's awesome. The storytelling is really good and really messes with your head. Um, it's a little bit brutal for the crew and the viewer, but we'll, we'll give it credit. And yeah, Red Foreman, man. He's the main bad guy, Anorex. And essentially what's going on in this one it opens, there's a cold open where we have this ship and they have a temporal incursion device. They essentially blast a planet and it disappears. Um, well, it, it goes from being a, having a civilization on it to being completely not have any technology on it at all. Um, and, uh, yes, it is. <laughs> A brutal time travel one. Um, they say that their astrometrics lab is complete. Yay! <laughs> um, we love the astrometrics lab. But <laughs> for, I mean, obviously we love the astrometrics lab. This is where essentially Seven and Harry Kim have worked hard merging the Starfleet and Borg databases to have the most precise navigation, astral navigation capability that has ever been done. Essentially what they're able to do is measure the radiative flux of three billion stars at once and calculate Voyager's position using that data relative to the center of the galaxy and they're able to chart a path home. Uh, using this method to figure out where they are in the galaxy is 10 times more accurate and eliminates, and then the path that they're able to build is five years off of their 70-ish year journey home. So, few things from that. We love it. <laughs> um, three billion stars at once. There are a lot of hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, so that's not unreasonable to say in a region. That would be a decent region. That's a ton of data. That's essentially being able to open up your aperture, whatever imaging device that you have, take in three billion points of information, separate them all, that's the hardest part, and then judge the relative distances um, compared to where they are against a database and compared. Now, how one would actually go about doing this, because we're talking about the science, um, you would need to know the absolute brightness of some of the stars. So that's where the database comes in handy. You'd have to know how much light some of the stars are actually emitting. 
You'd have to know then what you are perceiving. You'd have to know, um, you know, because then how far away you are from it, it's going to be, a that's their apparent luminosity versus their absolute luminosity. Um, so you'd have to be able to distinguish those. You'd use a database, and then all the ones that you don't know their absolute brightness, you'd have to then correlate the positions relative to that and any other information that you have um, to be able to do that. Which sucks! <laughs> I mean, this is one of those things where it's like, yeah, that would be, that's not physically impossible to do, but it would require centuries at most improvement in database and machine learning, I guess is how I would phrase that. And having the board would probably help there as well. Uh, but I love this idea. And the other thing too is remember that they are on the other side of the galaxy. Yeah, in quantum computing too, um, which means that their their database is is limited primarily because if you are on one side of the galaxy, the galaxy is a flat plane. When you look down it, um, such as when you look at the Milky Way at night, you just see this stream of light in the sky, and you see dark patches. Those dark patches are actually clouds and dust. That's parts where you can't see through it because there's too much stuff there. And so any sort of astro navigation capability that Starfleet might have would fall off pretty quickly when it came to the Delta Quadrant because you just wouldn't be able to see through the center of the galaxy to be able to image all of that. So we love it. <laughs> we love it. And, uh, and it works. And we have our astrometrics lab now before everything quite literally goes to hell. So they eliminate what is this, we then find out to be the Krenim species, Krenim people, have eliminated the Zal species. They're the ones who actually showed up, talked to Voyager, Voyager's hanging out with them. Um, that initial blip that they did basically eliminated the Zal from the timeline. And one of the things I like is that that weapon that they use to eliminate a species from the timeline propagates out at the speed of light, which kind of works, kind of works. Simply because Voyager is able to detect a temporal distortion coming at them, which is five light years across and getting bigger. Um, the vessel disappeared, the Zal vessel disappears they get a huge buildup of temporal energy and uh, a shockwave in space-time that destabilizes their warp field. All of that techno babble kind of works if you're talking about some big blip to the space, to effectively time. But remember, space-time is linked. It's space-time, so it's propagating out. And if we go to, my baby, the gravitational wave world, where we talk about distortions in space-time, Quite literally, things that happen that distort space-time, and I did see that blink a couple times. So, um, Einstein's calculations to take those distortions that happen to see what happens to those propagate out as gravitational waves that travel at the speed of light. So this all works. That if you are causing distortions to time, even if it's just to time itself that distortion is going to propagate out through space-time at the speed of light in the form of a gravitational wave, which is a spatial distortion. Win. And we managed, we've managed to basically talk about my entire academic research here <laughs> between the binary pulsar system and the gravitational propagations due to distortions in space-time. I'm good with that. Now the Zald completely disappears. Basically find out that the Krenum have... They call them chroniton-based torpedoes. They have temporal weapons is how the Krenum are able to behave. They figure out that these torpedoes are actually able to penetrate the shielding and the hull using temporal flux, which means that they shift in time and are able to penetrate. I mean, sure. We talked, was it two weeks ago about, or last week about temporal inertia 
this idea that our bodies would feel if we are slightly out of time because we are used to progressing at the same time uh, at one second per second. This basically, these weapons break through that. They zip through this temporal um, flux and they, uh, they can penetrate the shield and the hull from that. Um, now the elimination of this homework, now it flips to the Krenum, um, and our good buddy Red. They say that eliminating the Zal homeworld seemed to restore their timeline to 98%. They've, this incursion has repaired everything that we don't know what it is to a 98% goodness. Now, what we, now I, we can just talk about this plot in general at this point, I think, because effectively what they're doing is they have this like monster ship. <laughs> they have this monster ship and is it at Anorax is <laughs> red, the main bad guy. He's operating this ship and what they're able to do is create incursions in time. Incursions being basically pins where things break down that cause these ripple effects to happen. And what he's trying to do is to try to get back to this like base timeline that we learn is his, um, <laughs> that when they first tested this out, let me see, it was the, uh, let me see what the original one was. I wrote down, there's so many, yeah, the Rilnar. They basically built this this capability. And Beck, I see your question. I'll get to it in a second. Um, they basically built had this capability and destroyed a civilization with it that they had been warning warring against called the Rilnar. When they destroyed the Rilnar, it introduced an that propagation through the time, through the timeline. So they said, okay, Rilnar wiped from the timeline. What happened is, is that their species, the Krenum, started to get very, very sick because in the past, the sort of shared, you know, either DNA or origin of their species, the their interactions with the Rilnar had introduced an antibody into the Krenum. And so when you eliminated the Rilnar from the entire timeline, that antibody in the Krenum disappeared and they weren't able to fight off this disease and they started to get very sick. So they basically are like, oh, we screwed up and we got to fix everything. And then every time they fix it, they start to break things more um, because you, you're messing with time. And as we know that that's, things, things go bad when we do that. So Becca was saying, um, since Voyager was what Anorex claims to be the problem with their calculation, he's treating the whole quadrant as a closed system. Yes. So how would he keep a stray bit of matter from crossing into or out of his quadrant? That's an awesome, awesome question. So it is, it all has to do with systems engineering. <laughs> this idea that you're treating your timeline as a closed system and you think you can change one thing and within here that doesn't seem to impact anything it's gonna break and that's essentially and yeah quadrants are definitely made up because where's the edge the real real edge right with anything i mean this is heisenberg's uncertainty principle right where exactly does this desk end there's going to be an uncertainty to it when we get down to the quantum mechanics level but with these timelines that's pretty much exactly what we're talking about, that we have these closed systems that he says, okay, I think I've accounted for everything. Let's repair it all um, by moving this. That will cause that to happen, that to happen, that not to happen, that not to happen. And we should get the timeline I want. That's what his simulations all are doing. They're removing or adding parts and timelines and then seeing what happens to the entire system that uh, Anorax is looking at. Now, there are some really great discussions about this. I, they talk about Voyager being the problem with their calculation. I actually think that it was more, in addition to Voyager being part of the problem, 
they're never going to get back to 100% because with our issue with time travel, you're always going to have a fraction of a percent that is the thing that made you do what you did, <laughs> right? Because if you restore the timeline to what it was before you got the time travel device, um, then you're never going to have a time travel device and you're never going to be able to do it. So it's always going to be slightly, slightly off if you are trying to restore a timeline perfectly. Now he's trying to attain perfection. And then the fact that you can't think of all this time travel as a closed system and Voyager, as, as DTG said, is a disease vector, which I think is a good way of thinking about it. Um, you're not able to fully repair it at all. Um, and what's interesting is as these years go on, they're trying to, they're still trying to m mix with this timeline. And I do like how you can see, I recommend looking up all of these streams and then all the changes that happen. What annoys me is Chakotay. <laughs> Sorry, Becca. <laughs> um, the, so Chakotay in Paris, this is going on for almost a year, right? This whole back and forth, changing timelines, fighting Voyager, all of this stuff. Chakotay is basically like, oh, I'll help you, dude. Anorex, I got you. Um, yeah, let's fix it. Tom, he knows what he's talking about. And temporal, I get temporal mechanics now. You don't. You don't understand, Chakotay. Stop being dumb. Um, at least I can say he rocks his Adama facial hair better than Adama did. <laughs> no offense, Edward James almost. We love you. Uh, but he, yeah, he full on had the, the time has passed facial hair look, which I always love. Um, and it didn't, it looked pretty natural, which I appreciated. Now they've built, Anorex decides he needs to get rid of Voyager, right? In order to try to fix this timeline. He's just getting obsessed with the trying to figure out all of these points that he can change. I really like this scene with Chakotay and Anorex where he's basically now teaching Chakotay temporal mechanics and says, okay, so if you want to do this, what would you do? And Chakotay says, I would get rid of that comet, which would mean that was the reason Voyager swerved that landed us in your space. So if we get rid of the comet, now Voyager won't land with us. And he's like, okay, so simulate that. And he simulates it and 8,000 species disappear or 8,000 civilizations disappear. It had a propagating factor of like, what was it? 50 light year radius. It affected that many uh, star systems because that one comet, as it was hurtling through interstellar space, Fragments are falling off as it gets pulled to and then pushed away from comets or from stars. It gets pulled in, gravitational fields will tear off chunks of it. Those chunks will orbit and eventually land on planets and may contain, is what he explains here, hydrocarbons that will initiate life, essentially. Um, that kind of works. And that's one of the reasons that we study comets as carefully and as expensively as we do, that we send spacecraft to go land on comets to take information from comets, because even though the comets in our star system are on the far outer region and they're trapped gravitationally by our sun, they still are those like old ancient objects that are what our solar system and our cloud looked like when it was formed. So if we're able to find any sort of hydrocarbon chains or anything that could lead to organic life, that helps us understand where organic life came from here on earth and comets sort of seeding home worlds is one of those theories. Super cool, super valid. And yeah, Becca, great teaching moment. He was awesome. It was it was really interesting and to show how not just the impact that one tiny comet can have in a region of space, but to show how messing with a timeline causes so many problems to happen. Um, the issue though really is, and we've talked about this with our multiple timeline or time travel episodes of things that we've talked about, which I love. I love talking about this. 
The whole point is it's nonlinear dynamics. It's chaos theory. You change one thing that you've changed your starting conditions. So if you've gone back and changed starting conditions, even by a tiny amount, those tiny changes are going to propagate out. If you've ever played with a chaos pendulum, that's what I'm talking about, where you can pull it back, let it go, and that you might think that it's at the same spot, but change in the winds, change in all of these little, little things is going to make it go through a completely different pattern over time. It will start out going down the same path, and then it will quickly change. And the more dynamic a system is, the more variables you have, the more the changes in those starting conditions are going to propagate out and end up being un completely unpredictable. Um, <laughs> I think I would, I really desperately want to debate Bruce Banner on these topics. Because I think, I mean, I kind of agreed more with Bruce Banner when he was talking about those timelines because of this nonlinear dynamics. It's like you're never going to get perfectly back to where you were because you've changed the starting. The starting condition is never going to be exactly, exactly the same. That's chaos theory. It can never happen. Um, another great example of chaos theory, which has stuck into most of our minds, <laughs> is Jeff Goldblum dripping water down Laura Dern's hand explaining that the water is going to fall in a different direction every single time. It's never going to be exactly the same because every time the, the hair on your hand has changed, the cells have slightly changed. Now you have water introduced to it. So all of these little um, changes in your starting conditions are going to result in a different pattern happening. Um, <laughs> that's all right. No worries. It would be an interesting conversation. We'll put it that way. But yeah, this whole discussion of time travel and trying to fix timelines and trying to repair timelines, it's it's almost physically impossible because of chaos theory and because of nonlinear dynamics. <laughs> exactly. Microscopic imperfections. Just microscopic. <laughs> um, it all comes down to chaos theory and nonlinear dynamics, which is just the techno babbly term for chaos theory. That small changes to your starting condition propagate out and you can never account for every single tiny starting condition. It's always going to be slightly different. Thank you, quantum physics. <laughs> All those probabilities of where electrons are at any one point, the whole Schrodinger's cat of knowing where a particle exactly is because we can never know exactly where these subatomic particles are, we're never going to replicate identical starting conditions. So yeah, it's, it's interesting and I love it. I love it. Okay. Now all of that being said, yeah, <laughs> I mean, fair. And maybe that's how Heisenberg compensator, maybe if we talk about, what led to time travel capability, I bet you the Heisenberg compensator is probably a part of that. I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. Um, as they're fighting them and awful things are happening, I mean, there's some, there's some funny nonsense techno babble that just always makes me chuckle, like reverse the osmotic pressure in the Jeffries tube. Sure. <laughs> um, they do put subspace beacons in all the escape pods. And we've talked a little bit about the subspace beacons before. This idea that you can have buoys that kind of like puncture through space time. And so you're able to actually like contact each other faster than the speed of light. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, any sort of time travel, once we, the reason we all get headaches once we try to rationalize time travel is because of chaos theory. Even if you don't know that that's why it's because you start realizing how many factors are in there, let alone this idea of free will, let alone all of the things that rely on one or the other. It all just starts to fall apart really, really quickly. Um, now, oh yeah, they also hide in a nebula, which was fun. And then when they tried to leave, they ran into a micrometeor shower, which was not so fun, <laughs> but valid. Started puncturing the hull. Uh, remember their deflector sheet, their deflector array was completely down. So that the deflector array is partially like what helps you deflect micrometeors in space from hitting your hull. 
So it's like kind of the the cattle thing that keeps it going away. Um, this is when I understood deflector array. Awesome. <laughs> or that A, yeah, exactly. I mean, we talked about Roswell that ends well. It's fabulous. Um, so yeah, it is. It's it's a perfect example. Um, so I still continued to be frustrated with Chakotay. I, if you're a patron, you'll see in my notes. I'm frustrated with Chakotay a lot in this. <laughs> um, they do... They reach, again, this is two episodes in a row. Well, okay, like uh, one episode, then the first part of a two-parter, then the end of the two-parter. Janeway's done. <laughs> and it's interesting to see from a character perspective that she knows when she's reached her limit and she will sacrifice for the greater good. Um, And she will shut it down if someone has pissed her off enough. And we love her for that. But she is our, like, all right, I'm done. And drives Voyager into the ship, into the Cranum ship. And it essentially obliterates the temporal core and resets everything. It all rephases to normal space time. Um, or they rephase into normal space time, this massive ship, which allows Janeway to, like, go in and punch it. It destabilizes this temporal core, and then they they experience a temporal incursion throughout the ship, which basically says um, that they yeah going out with a vengeance. Ex I mean yeah, that's exactly what it is. But because that ship itself, which caused all these temporal incursions to happen, experiences a temporal incursion itself, that's where I feel like they repair the timelines in a way that they at least all get back to a point where what if this ship never existed? And I was thinking like, okay, well, well, if, how would you ever go back and repair all these just by removing the ship from it? But I think it's the fact that this ship exists in a different, like, you know, when Anorax was talking to both Chakotay and Obrist as well. Obrist was the name I was looking up. Um, he's like, you're not, you're thinking about time too conventionally. You need to be thinking about time differently. And he talks about the flavor and the color and the moods of space, of time. Um, I think, and I was trying, because I remember, obviously, uh, not obviously, that's, I just remembered that the ship does get destroyed and the timeline gets restored. I was like, well, but how would just destroying the ship restore the timeline? But I think the key in the dialogue is that it that they themselves have this temporal core and that they experienced an incursion throughout their own ship. So it essentially imploded on itself. Um, so the questions were, if these are all multiverses, wouldn't these exist anyway? Yes, and that's kind of the, oh God, what was that TNG episode that we all watched um, where they had all the multiple timelines all show up? Uh, Shatter was it Shattered, the one with Worf? Parallels, yeah, Parallels, um, the one with Worf, where he was basically had to unify all these timelines again. You can think about it this way, and you can think about that threshold that Worf went through that caused all of those quantum timelines to, like, start exposing themselves to each other. Uh, that that threshold, you can think of that ship as that threshold. Thank you. <laughs> You're right, Shattered is a Voyager episode. I can't remember them all. <laughs> um, but you can think of this Krenum ship as being that barrier, if you remember from Parallels, that kind of exposed all these that Worf went through, that ship, if it destroys itself, then it's no longer a point where all of those timelines are touching, and it just unthreads all of them. It So it unthreads all of them and makes them all independent again. Even though it caused them to exist, I think at the very least that they're not all tied together. Because remember, the ship is going back and they're like, they're making some repairs and they're um, they're like undoing decisions that they've made 
And they're just like, they're touching every single possible timeline at any time um, and messing around with all of them that I think when they experience a temporal incursion, it basically removes that, that point from all of these timelines and at the very least just separates them all again. Whereas with that ship existing, because they're causing all of it, they're all at some point tied together. I think that makes sense. It kind of makes sense in my mind. And I'm just pic trying to picture the image that they used in parallels with Worf's ship and all the quantum timelines compared to how the Krenum were visualizing all of these timelines. That ship was the point where they all interact with each other. I think it works. I think it kind of works. And then when you remove it, you separate them all. And um, so do you think it would be a change where the... I mean, you can say that those timelines all continue to exist. Did, you know, if you think about it, did Voyager, Voyager's timeline actually happen? Was there a timeline where that existed? We saw a timeline where that existed. And then when it ended its timeline and destroyed the ship and took it with it, that isolated that year of hell that Voyager went through, went back to the beginning, ship no longer exists, and it just carries on. Um... So, but that timeline still existed. It's just no longer a t in touch with all the other ones. It can, Andrew. <clears throat> Cheers. <laughs> I'm learning to provide myself with alcohol or other, whatever your preferred calming <laughs> means are <laughs> to try to get through time travel discussions. It's freaking hard, man. It's it's really difficult to try to wrap our heads around. Um, but I think it makes sense. And what's kind of cool is it's in terms of a time travel episode, I like the fact that this is a two-parter. I like the fact that um, we witnessed this all happen. And I feel like they closed the loop pretty tightly. They say, okay, we've removed this particular ship, this particular person's actions, and this particular technology from the timeline the Krenum species still continues to exist. We didn't, you know, wipe them all out, which is good. <laughs> um, and Voyager continues down its own particular timeline. We haven't talked about that episode with the multiple Voyagers and the multiple Harry Kims. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in Relics, the stuff that, uh, was that in, that wasn't in Dory Nail, that was... It was, yeah, the stuff that Picard gave to Guinan, the green stuff, does help a lot. Um, is, oh, Becca, that's such a good question. Is Star Trek's choice of time travel theory consistent across the Trekverse? No. <laughs> and I can say that with a lot of authority. I will try to find, I do not, oh, I don't think I have it handy. Just in the last minute, let me see if I can look this up real quick. Because it is, it was a Deborah and Whiskey. Thank you. I love you, Star Trek fans. You are fabulous. Um, I do have this image really quick. I can try to pull up. Um, where I tried to break down every single possible method of, of time travel in Star Trek. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. And I did it. And it was awful. <laughs> and let me, yeah, it's consistently inconsistent, but that doesn't mean I didn't try. <laughs> um, let me see. Okay. I'm just, if I accidentally don't, okay, we're going to add this on here. Here we go. All right. Sorry for the blockiness. <laughs> this is my time travel in Star Trek chart where I tried to figure out every single method that Star Trek has ever used um, and and what's consistent and what's not. <laughs> I will put it up on Twitter. I will put it up on my website. Um, I'll also put it up on the Patreon page <laughs> so people can see it. Um, I gave this talk at Star Trek Las Vegas last year where we tried to analyze, the, I, will, I will do that right now um, once we're done here. Um, so if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find 
the links down below. I will put it up within the next 10 minutes. Um, but yeah, I gave a talk at Star Trek Las Vegas on time travel in Star Trek and basically looked like a conspiracy theorist on my whiteboard for about two weeks while I watched and read about every single time travel episode and the method that they used for the time travel. And it was... <laughs> it's consistently inconsistent, but there are some consistencies throughout it. <laughs> so that's the way I would put it. Um, but I would recommend some Aldebaran whiskey before you dig into that. <laughs> um, I have not read the time travel book Lightning by Dean Koontz, Andrew. Thank you. I will check that out. Um, and yes, I was the right person to ask about that. Um, so if you ever, I mean, this is why I, I, I do what I do for Star Trek is if they want to do time travel, we can, we'll figure out a way. Um, I love it. All right. We will put that up on Twitter. It is dedication to time. Thank you, Brad. And, uh, with that, we are at the top of the hour. So thank you for hanging out with me. If you are a patron, the poll is up now for what we are going to discuss next week. Um, there's some goodies in there and I appreciate all of you hanging out with me, all of you, <laughs> I could indeed, um, all of you, uh, enjoying that time travel talk with me. I know it's a little bit headache inducing, but it's fun. So with that, I will be doing a special interview tomorrow at 1 PM Pacific time with Mark Zakri. Uh, who wrote Far Beyond the Stars, the Deep Space Nine episode, as well as a lot of other popular science fiction. Um, I will record that, post that to YouTube as well. And then I will be finishing Mass Effect 1 on Thursday. Friday, I am going to be doing Astronomy 101 again. And then on Sunday, I have my Star Trek brunch, but I'm also taking part in the Connected Convention that the science division, the people who make the tribbles, if you've been to Star Trek Las Vegas, are hosting. So I will basically have a table, virtual table, if you sign up for the convention, it's free. I will be on my at my table for three hours on Sunday that you can come and hang out and ask any questions you like. So it should be fun. Thank you all for hanging out. Sorry about the blips with the camera. I'll try to fix that. And uh, until next time, live long and prosper. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Bye.